Thank you also to the worship team, and good to see you guys. I'm glad to see you, and you don't have to be glad to see me, which is okay. <laughs> it's like, oh, him again, how long is this going to be? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, kids, you're dismissed, so kids, you're free to go down to your classes. Glad that you're here, and glad that you as parents and guardians and uncles and aunts and grandparents have entrusted us to help you to raise your kids in the faith. And as they are going, um, if you are interested in having a beautiful, colorful Crosspoint sweatshirt, you need to get that ordered today. So if you've been holding off, oh, when are I should order, <laughs> today's your day. So please just go back to the Welcome Center. Uh, you can get your size, you can get your color. They'll be ordering that today, but you cannot get them after today, so I do want to pass that on to you for sure. And by the way, at the end of the service, we will be receiving communion, so if you have not yet picked up the communion cup, you're in good shape. Our ushers will come down right when communion is going to be served. Pastor Michael is going to be leading in us in that. And if you're at home, uh, we're having communion. And by the way, good to see you guys, or I guess good to be seen by you guys on the internet. And I uh, hope you guys are doing good wherever you are. I know a number of no, yeah, numbers of people join us that way. <clears throat> Excuse me, still still working with the throat tickle. Good to see you, by the way. Yeah, good to see you. All right, if you have a Bible, go ahead, open up. We are going again to the Gospel of John. I know it's a shocker. We're uh, 31 messages in. We're going to go through the entire book, verse by verse, and we are in chapter 12 today. And I want to um, draw your attention to a fact that these, this passage that we're looking at today is the last words of Jesus for his public ministry. Okay, so you know, like we're in chapter 12 and there's a lot of um, John left. That's true, there's a lot of John left. But after today, there's a, there's a shift in what the gospel is doing. So next week we'll see, and this is chapter 13, the foot washing, okay? This is right for the Last Supper, and you'll see all of the teachings from chapter 13, and then it continues on, being with the disciples, the vine and the branches, uh, Jesus' priestly prayer, and then the crucifixion, and the resurrection, and the reestablishment of Peter, which is important, and the ascension. And so there's a shift from Jesus' outward facing ministry to the public, which he's been doing for three years up to this point, and then the dialogue, the narrative, the focus in the gospel then points to and slows down in capturing all that happened um, on, on the night he was betrayed, and we slow down to look at that. So keep that in mind. So what we look at today is important. And if you've been with us for a while, we'll recognize that the point of the Gospel of John is to declare the identity of Jesus, that he indeed is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you and I may have life in his name. That is the stated purpose for this Gospel and the Gospels. Time and time and time again, we read about Jesus proclaiming who he is and performing many miracles from raising the dead to feeding crowds of people to knowing things that only God would know, and there's lots of evidences. Those being signs of uh, proof that Jesus is indeed God, who he says he is. And so these proofs are putting forward, and again, all of us have to come to a determination as to our understanding of who Jesus is, and then take stock of what he declared. And his words are powerful, they're profound, they're somewhat startling at times, and we're going to see some of those again today, and then make a decision if he is telling the truth and if we will be following him. So right at the beginning of our section today, the Apostle John is giving some commentary, and he is inspired by the Holy Spirit. The words in black are just as much scripture. If you have a Bible that has Jesus' words in red, they're all scripture. And John, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, brings to the surface some of the reasons that people have rejected Jesus. So we're going to look at why people reject Jesus and what's the heart of that. And then he talks about why people 
disown Jesus, not just then, but in our own day. And then Jesus will hear, his ver- uh, he will hear from him crying out that he indeed is the face of the Father. When you see him, you are seeing God. And then right after that, when he speaks, he is the voice of the Father. Our first point is the longest point because we're going to dive into Isaiah. And then we'll look at some of these other, um, other points. Excuse me again. <clears throat> So my hope is, and the prayer is, that every Sunday, that God would give us ears to hear. That's what I pray for us as a congregation. That's what I pray for you as an individual. That God would spark something in your mind this morning. That there will be a verse or a concept or a line or of something that God would speak to you. So that is the prayer, and I trust that God will do that with you today. And thank you again. You guys are always so good to be saying, hey, let me figure out what's being said there and being focused in on what God may be saying to us. Okay? So here's the first point. My, point, my points come before the passage. Often it's not that way, but today it will be. The first point is this, why Jesus is rejected. Okay? Not just then, but again, also today. So we're going to pick it up, John chapter 12, starting with verse 37. And we're going to break it down point by point. I'm going to take one more drink here. I'm reading from the NIV version, and that version is right in front of you as well in the pew. So here we go. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. Now, this was to fulfill the words of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Okay, let's just stop right there. So Jesus said who he was, again, and then gave proof to who he was by performing miracles or signs. We just read it here in their presence. Signs pointing to he is God. And often when Jesus... um, did a miracle, it is fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, which stated the person who does this is God. And so not only did Jesus proclaim who he was and taught profound (laughs) things, he performed these miracles as proof or evidence that he was who he said he was. But even people seeing these signs, seeing these wonders, they refused to believe. And it is true today as well, no matter how much in our day that people would see, and God still does heal, God still does do miracles, God still does actively work in his power by his spirit, he still does these things. And some people, regardless of the logic, regardless of the evidence, regardless of what they see or perhaps even experience, refuse to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and they refuse to put their faith or give their life over to Him. So why is this? Well, the Apostle John quotes then this passage from Isaiah 53. So put your finger in John 12 or put your bookmark in there. Go back to the Old Testament. We're going to spend time in Isaiah on two different places looking at the quotes which John references by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So the quote is from Isaiah chapter 53. So go ahead and turn there. And um, I'm going to read just the first six verses. Now, if you're a church-going person, these verses will be familiar to you. This is Isaiah, who was a prophet in Israel, about 700, 800 years before Christ arrived, saying that this is who the Messiah will be. And this is a profound passage. And Jesus fulfilled everything that was spoken or prophesied in this passage. So when John quotes this passage in reference to Jesus, he is saying to those people there and is saying to all people everywhere that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one who fulfills this passage. Okay, So let's just read a portion of it. And this week, I would encourage you just to read the whole thing. Think about how this was fulfilled in Christ. Think about what this means and why it matters to you. 
Think about its implications. So this is Isaiah 53. It starts this way. Who has believed our message? This was what John quoted. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Verse 2. Now he grew up before him like a tender shoot. And like a root out of dry ground, I want you to think about Jesus, right? A dry place, Nazareth, a tender baby growing up. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and he was rejected by mankind. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom... People hide their faces. He was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely, he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So John quotes this as a reason why people reject Jesus. Now we have to think about that, right? So people who reject Jesus often are looking for a beautiful, majestic, powerful superhero type, right? We love our superheroes in this country, right? Marvel movies, anyone watch any Marvel movies? I'm the only one that watches Marvel movies. I know you've watched them, right? We like our Superman. We, we like our... <laughs> Did someone say Wonder Woman? Okay, all right. We like our superheroes, right? Right? We like Wonder Woman, right? She's beautiful. She's powerful. She's above everything. We like Thor because he has these great powers and he can overcome. We like these images, Superman and the like, right? We want our rescuers to be above everything, <laughs> Powerful, majestic, commanding, authoritative to rescue us from our enemies or our oppressors or, you know, the evil that's coming in. We like that. When Jesus came the first time, <laughs> he didn't appear that way. Right? It says here that he was like a weak reed, right? which is interesting. He grew up like a shoot. It says that there was nothing really attractive about him, right? He was an ordinary-looking dude, right? Maybe a little bit ugly. Right? Now, we like our Jesuses and films to be beautiful, right? Just like he was, blonde hair and blue eyes. <laughs> so glad you laughed by that. <laughs> he was Middle Eastern, right? More than likely pretty short, be real honest, people around that time were pretty short. He wasn't like flowing hair, you know, and honestly, his, his eyes, I'm sure, were piercing, right? Just an ordinary dude, right? And he wasn't above pain and suffering. He was familiar with it. Did you catch that? Right? Man of sorrows, man of familiar with pain which helps us to know that we have a Savior God who understands our pain and your suffering. And they thought that the Savior surely would come in on a white horse, not on a donkey. Right? Are you guys catching this? Right? Right? And instead of um, throwing out or, or conquering the um, occupying forces at the time, which was Rome, these oppressors. He didn't come in and do that. He came in and what? Was killed. Pierced. The 
destroyed. The scripture said this was to happen. <laughs> Pierce for our transitions. Right? And so people reject Jesus, right? They reject him because they're not how we want him to be. But he's exactly how we need him to be. In order to receive Jesus as your Lord, you have to acknowledge a few things. And these things, if you're proud, you don't want to acknowledge. I've talked to people, many people, who do not believe Jesus is God, or they think he's a moral teacher, but they haven't put his faith in them, in him. Why? Because in order to put your faith or believe in Christ, you have to, number one, believe that you're sinful. <laughs> Most people don't want to believe that, right? Especially in America, with our self-help, we want to say, hey, you're a good person, you just had some hard circumstances, and you know what? Your goodness or glory will shine through. That's our message in America. The message from Scripture is all have sinned and fallen. What is that short of the glory of God? So in order to receive Jesus, you have to acknowledge your sinfulness. And often people don't want to. Now, in order to believe in Jesus, then you have to believe not only in your own sinfulness, but in God's sovereignty. Right? People don't like having to be accountable to a righteous and holy God, right? Think about the people you know in your family, perhaps, or friends. They don't like that concept. They don't like having to be account accountable. And so, not only do you have to believe in your own reality of your own fallenness, not only do you have to agree that there is a creator, sovereign God in whom we are going to be giving an account, you have to believe that, and you'll have to recognize your name for a savior or a substitute, because if we were to pay the penalty of our sin, none of us would get into heaven, because you and I are a trespasser, right? We are a criminal, so to speak. We do not merit heaven by our behavior, Christ is the only person who lived perfectively. Perfectively? I guess that's a word. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. English is tough, right? <laughs> He's the only one that lived perfectly. <laughs> and he took the punishment due us on him. Right? Pierce for our transgressions. Salvation is about substitution. It's called atonement. That's a theological word. And you have to believe that Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Thank you, John. Right? And you have to recognize um, our sinfulness and his perfection. And he is the Savior that we need. So it requires humility. And people often reject Jesus, because they don't want to acknowledge these things about God, these things about themselves and what Jesus did and had to say. So John quotes this passage saying, hey, this Jesus that I'm talking to you about is the Jesus that was prophesied in Isaiah 53. And read again that passage. This is he, and you did not receive him because you did not anticipate him and you wanted a superhero and here was a suffering servant. He's rejected. Now it's really interesting to me then how John connects Isaiah 53 with the next passage, Isaiah chapter 6. If you have a Bible, turn to it. John connects these two passages in Isaiah to say that because they would not believe that Jesus was their Savior, then they could not receive Jesus as their King. They would not believe, so they could not believe. Okay. Now, it's interesting to think about this, and we're going to see this in context. 
People chose not to receive him in his day. They choose not to receive him in our day because they do not want to acknowledge things that are true. And so because of that choice of not receiving Christ as Savior, we will not see him as king. So let's go, John chapter 12, we'll go back to that and we'll go to Isaiah 6, okay? We're looking at these in context. John 12, verse 39. John continues, now for this reason, they could not believe, right? So they would not believe, so they could not believe. Because as Isaiah says elsewhere, and here's the quote, he, God, has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. So they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Now in the book of Isaiah, obviously Isaiah 53 comes after Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, and we're going to read a portion of it, was the vision in which Isaiah the prophet saw Jesus as king in his glory. And in John connecting these two passages and putting Isaiah 53 ahead of Isaiah 6, he's saying if you reject him as your savior, you will not reign with him as your king. You will not see him as your king because you cannot see him as your savior. So therefore, you cannot reign with him and nor will you reign with him nor see his glory. It is pretty startling. So here is Isaiah chapter 6. Again, I want you to envision this is Christ that they're talking about. This is the uh, glory of Jesus here. It starts this way, right? And just imagine this, of seeing this vision. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. Two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Now Isaiah, seeing this, he said, woe is me. I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips. I have lived among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. This is atonement. Your guilt is taking away and your sins atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? Who will go for me? And I said, Here I am. Send me, he said. Now go and tell this people, and this is the quote, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the hearts of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. This is a profound passage. It's the king and his glory. These angelic beings, six wings, crying, holy, holy, holy. It is powerful. It is like a superhero coming on the clouds, right? above and beyond and glorious, accompanied by angels and power renowned. This is the great king. 
This also is the image that we see in Revelation chapter 19 of the king coming in his glory. And because people refused to receive him as their humble savior, they will not be able to see him as their great king. Because people do not receive him as a suffering savior, they will not reign with him as the glorified king. If you don't bow to him as the suffering servant, servant, you will not stand with him as the glorifying king. You cannot have the crown without the cross. And through the cross is the only way to see the king. Do you understand? Right. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 talks about at a point in time, every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Did you catch that in, in, in Philippians? So you'll have to say, well, surely in eternity, people will then behold the majesty of Christ and see him how he is and then repent of their sins. <laughs> At that point, it's too late. You receive him how he is and how and believe in faith that the words of the scripture and of Christ are true, that we will behold him in his glory. John, in explaining, in giving the reason why people rejected Jesus in the time and soon will see him crucified, right? Again, many people believed, but many people opposed, just like our day. Many people believe, many people oppose, right, in our day as well. It says they will oppose him because they fail to receive him as he is and acknowledge who they are, who he is. This is a problem and still happens today. You think about people that you know that you've shared the gospel with that don't receive it. Often these are the reasons, right? if not every single time. They want to see him as superhero. We want to see him as moral counselor, right? Therapeutic, their, their therapist, right? But to acknowledge that I'm sinful, I need a savior, that he's God, I need to follow him. I don't know. I'm going to call on him next time I'm in trouble so Superman can come save me, but I don't want to follow him, right? Does that sound familiar? Right? This is the crux of the issue. Understand that in your own heart. Understand that primarily why people reject him. So not only is Jesus was rejected, and, and, and we get the reasons why, why Jesus is rejected. Secondly, why Jesus is disowned, right? So you see this rejection that the Apostle John is telling us about, and then we'll see people who believed and disown him and why that happens. So why Jesus is disowned, this is the second point of this passage, John 12, 42. Yet at the same time, many, uh, even among the leaders, believed in him. Right? So there were those who were rejected and the leaders rejected as well, most, but there were also many who believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, these were the ruling people at that time, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, which was the church, the temple in that time. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. Ooh. That's a significant condemnation, accusation, reality. So here are some people who did believe in Jesus. Right? Even some of the leaders did so. But they would not openly acknowledge their faith. They wouldn't share it or state it publicly. That they indeed did believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So why didn't they say these things or acknowledge these things? Because they were afraid they were afraid that they would be rejected and not be received by 
the group. Okay, I don't know exactly what that was all about, but uh, it's being taken care of. So um, let's pray. We'll pray for him. So let's do that. God, would you pray for this young man, God? Um, whatever's on his heart, whatever he's struggling with, God, I ask that um, you would speak to him. Let your power overshadow him. That you would minister to this young man. God. We're grateful that your spirit does indeed move among us, God. And we acknowledge, Lord, that not only are people for you, God, but there are some people who are against you, even in our day and age. God, we ask that we would have the courage and the faith to our commitments that you are indeed the Christ, the Son of God. That we would follow you in every circumstance and instance. In Jesus' name, amen. Hopefully you're not too startled. <laughs> Things happen. It's okay. Right? God is working. God is moving. He's among us. He never stops. That's right. So why do people... <laughs> Uh, perfect timing, actually, of that. Why do people disown Christ? Because they're scared that people will come against them. Right. Have you ever <laughs> hidden Christ in your heart and not talked about him because you were scared of what people would think of that? Well, let's be honest, right? I don't know if they think I'm a believer. They may come against me. They may not admit me to their club or their group or the social function or invite me over to this or I might not be able to climb the whatever ladder or be accepted by the friend group, okay? These things are real, right? By the way, even Peter, the apostle Peter, felt this pressure. We're going to see that as we continue to read through the gospel. Right? We're going to see that as we continue to see the gospel. And Peter failed this test. And he wept bitterly. We're going to read this. Jesus in his graciousness restored Peter. We're going to see that at the very end of the gospel. And Peter then went on to be a bold witness for Christ. By no mistake, he was the first one in Acts that proclaimed to the masses who Jesus was. And Peter eventually lost his life for his proclamation of the gospel. There are people in this world right now that if they declare that they believe in Jesus Christ, they will be disowned by their families. Right? I'm thinking Middle East in particular, Muslim countries in particular. Okay? Uh, it's in the Pacific, it's in Africa as well, in various places. More so, <laughs> you think you have it hard here as an American? Try living in Saudi Arabia. Okay. There's people today that if they declare or get baptized, which is a public declaration, right, they will be disowned. They will be dismembered sometimes. They'll be murdered sometimes. These things happen. So wouldn't it be better for them just to not say anything? They would live, right? Right? <laughs> if you want to gain your life, you're going to lose your life. So here's a problem with hidden faith. These again are um, stark words. This is by Jesus. This is in the Gospel of Matthew. This is what he said in Matthew 32. 
He said, Jesus said, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. That's really heavy. So we have to ask ourselves, who do we love more? Jesus or ourselves? Who do we fear more? God or others? Whose glory do we want more? God's or people's? Truth is, if you don't acknowledge Jesus before others, Jesus will not acknowledge you before his Father. That seems pretty strong. (laughs) It is strong. His name matters. His testimony matters. It matters that people know. I have a good friend who... um, Well, some of you know him, actually. You know him. He's a Gideon. His name is Dave Yeomans. A number of you might know this guy. He's a Gideon in town, friend of mine. He he worked um, at a at a business here in town for I don't know how many years it was. Late into his 40s, and someone shared Christ with him, not at work. And Dave accepted the message. It changed his life. He is a gospel gangster. (laughs) I guess I've never used that phrase before. He's about it, right? He gives and he goes and he passes out scriptures. He loves people. But when Dave came to faith, he started witnessing to his coworkers. And he found out that many of his coworkers were Christians And he was angry. He said, you've known me for 20 years and you never told me about Jesus. You never told me about Jesus. When I heard that from Dave, and he's a guy who lives here in Rockford, hit me between the eyes. Lord, help us to acknowledge you in front of people. And often we don't because we're scared. May our love for Christ be greater than our fear of people. So I hope you see him in his glory. The great fuel and the hope of evangelism and missions is loving Jesus more. Because if we see him in his glory, we see him and hear him in his love and his purity and his power, That will motivate us to share him, regardless if people receive him or reject him. I've heard stories of um, people in China, this is happening even today, that if they acknowledge Jesus, they'll be sent to prison. And so, there's a lot to that, but that's that's the case in many, many places. Um, so, I was reading this book, and some of the people acknowledged Jesus and went to prison. But some of the believers didn't acknowledge Jesus and didn't go to prison. And so, after the eight years of infliction, there was these conversations, right? W- what do you do? <laughs> people repented and changed, and some of the guys, I heard this, I thought this line was incredible. Um, they re- read about Peter, and he would say... I, Um, The pain of persecution and separation is less than the pain of uh, weeping bitterly at denying Jesus as my Lord. He says, I do not want to weep bitterly. I'd rather face whatever is there because I love him that much. So think about your own life, right? (laughs) The times in which, you know, we put our Christianity on the down low, right? We don't want anyone to know. Try being a pastor, by the way. <laughs> what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor, right? 
you want to clear a room, that's a good way to do it. I'm going to go over there. <laughs> it's a thing, I'm telling you. <laughs> some people want to be around you. Some people don't. <clears throat> but we all at times struggle with this. <laughs> Lord, help us to see him better. Clearer. And acknowledge him before people. Your neighbors, your co-workers, your family, your friend group. This is for all of us. Consider this. So John, okay, gives us this commentary. Why people reject Jesus. And then we'll see its fullness in the crucifixion. Why people disown Jesus out of fear. And we'll see that happening as well. Praise God for his grace for helping to re reinstate, giving us opportunities, but there is a price to pay for disowning him. Now, here are the verses. Right? This is, now we hear Jesus. This is his last public statement. Again, picture the scene, Jerusalem. Some say there are millions of people there, which there probably were in the city. Jesus came in the, on, on this donkey. They were declaring, Hosanna, right? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He was fulfilling scriptures, stating that he is the Christ. He knew that in the crowd, not only were those who were saying Hosanna, those were people there that were going to change or were going to say crucify in just 24 hours from this point. Jesus cries out to the crowd, whoever believes in me, does not believe in me only. The point, Jesus is the face of the Father. Listen to this passage. Whoever believes in me, Jesus was saying, does not believe in me only. But in him, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. Right? Significant. I have come into the world as light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. So when you see the face of Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, you see the face of the Father. If you believe in the Son, you also believe in the Father. Now conversely, if you don't have Jesus as your Savior, you don't have God as your Father. Okay. Jesus said in John, 1 John, hmm, Chapter, 1 John chapter 2, verse 23, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. This has huge implications for all of the religions who say they follow God but reject Jesus as the Son of God. Do you, you hear that? There are billions, with a B, of people on this planet currently who believe in God. The names could be Allah to others. But they reject Jesus as the Son of God. So scripture says, okay, this is what it says. No one who denies the Son has the Father. But whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. This is significant. In the land of America, we love being spiritual. You go to an awards show, you hear many of the people, I thank God for blessing me with my foul, foul lyric song that won the first place. Praise God. I don't know if God had anything to do with that. I'd like to ask some of them, okay? Glad you acknowledge there is a God. That's a great start. What do you believe about Jesus? Who is Jesus? And do you know what Jesus said? 
do you follow him? Stumbling block, right? Cornerstone. So Jesus' last declarations to the crowd saying, I've come into the world as light, and you see this all over the Gospel of John, giving greater opportunity, another opportunity, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness, the darkness of our sin, the darkness of our separation from the light and the glory of God. No one has to stay there. Those who believe in Him as the face of the Father, When you see him, you see the Father, they will see the light, and they will not stay in darkness. It gives opportunity. I have other scriptures there you can look. And then coupled with that, Jesus in his declaration to the crowds before he turns to the upper room, excuse me, the the room for the, the Last Supper, until he turns there, he says this, Alongside of it, not only is he the face of the Father, he is the voice of the Father. John chapter 12, verse 47. If anyone hears my words, but does not keep them, I don't judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Okay, this is what Jesus came for. Initially, this is what he was doing. He was coming as the Savior. Do you remember that? Not as the glorious king, but as the Savior. He says, I'm coming here to save the world, not to judge the world. But he continues, verse 48. Now, there is a judge for the one who rejects me. There is a judge for the one who does not accept my words. Well, who is the judge? The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. For I did not speak On my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that His command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Another claim saying that when you hear His voice, you hear the voice of God. Did you hear this? He said, I came to save you, to live perfectly sinlessly, to take your place for the sin you have committed. That's what I came to do, Jesus said. But if you reject me and you reject the words that aren't just my words, but the words of God the Creator, when God speaks something, it happens, it remains always, right? He says, if you reject that, I am not going to judge you, but those words will judge you. That you failed to believe, that you failed to listen, that you failed to follow because you didn't want that Savior. You wanted someone or something different. Those words will judge you. That's the last thing Jesus said in the Gospel of John publicly. Proclaiming, giving opportunity that people would believe still yet as the crowds were determining what they believed, they were determining what they would say, they were determining what they would do, they were wondering about this man giving opportunity but saying, I've come to save you, but if you reject me, those words will be your judge. As it was then, so it is today. Jesus came to save the world, not to judge or condemn the world. Again, however, if you choose to reject Jesus as a Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the words, His claims, His teachings of Christ will condemn you. When you hear the words of Jesus, you hear the words of God. So here's the question. Here are questions for us. Do you believe? Will you follow? Will you commit as to me and my house? We're serving the Lord. A person can take that away. A person can remove that from your heart. Do you believe? Will you 
follow? Will you commit yourself to Him, losing your life to gain your life? Now, I'm not saying you're going to die as a martyr. Probably no one in here will do that. You could, and I could. Talking about losing your life every day. I'm going to serve Christ regardless. I'm going to give myself over regardless. I'm going to do what is in accord to what the Holy Spirit, and when you believe the Holy Spirit comes into your life, what he's telling me to do, not as my old nature wants me to do. That's the sinful nature, things that we were born with. We have a choice. I have a choice. You have a choice every day to die to yourself, pick up your cross daily, and what? Follow him. So that's my charge to you. I want you to understand so you can pray for people who have rejected Christ. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. You pray that they would see Jesus as he is and receive themselves who they are and receive him as their Savior. That's how we are to pray. And we pray, God, help me to stand up and acknowledge you before people in the context where you are afraid. And it doesn't say it'll, he'll take away your fear, but it does say that he will acknowledge you before the Father. It takes courage to walk forward. So God, give me courage. Help my love for you be greater than my love for me. Let him be your greatest treasure of your heart, the one you live to honor most. We have to examine ourselves. Our hearts make your choice. Now again, next week we're going to see a shift. You're going to hear stuff that's important, powerful, especially if you're a disciple. You need to read this. Guess what? You can read ahead. Go ahead and spoil it. <laughs>